Hello, everyone, and welcome to the question and answer forum for doing business with Brazil. With Brazil. We're going to get started here today. Um, you guys are uh, taking care of your, uh, your screens and getting them in the right position and, and uh, getting all the uh, settings right the way you like them. Make sure you enter your questions into the Q&A button down below. We'll be uh, answering those um, near the end of our, of our time together. Um, so get them in now. And uh, as you go, if more, more questions pop into your brain, feel free to enter them there. Um, while you're adjusting your screens and, and submitting those questions, I'll tell you a little bit about Scarborough. Um, we're a full service global transportation provider. We also um, have been in business for over 30 years. And uh, we offer not only international, but also domestic transportation solutions, including customs brokerage as well, warehousing, fulfillment, consulting, and even we can customize some of the solutions to your needs as, as your businesses uh, as your businesses have those, those issues. Um, don't hesitate to contact us. Email us, phone call us, any, any, any day of the week. Um, we're ready to, to jump in and help you guys out with your shipping problems or your global trade needs. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Chad Cluton. Um, I'm a supply chain specialist and happy to be your host today. Uh, we also have with us Darcy Barnes. She's uh, in our St. Louis office. She's an export specialist with, with Scarborough. And then we also have Fabio Yamada. He's with uh, Trade BRZ. Um, and he's literally calling us from Brazil. So he's uh, by far the, the foremost expert <laughs> um, on the call today with, with, with Brazil. Um, they share a lot of knowledge with us. Fabio, thanks for joining us today, and we're excited to learn from you. Um, I'm going to introduce yourself and also your, your presentation to us, so take it away, Fabio. Okay, Chad. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I have been working in Brazil for the past 17 years uh, promoting uh, exports from the U.S. to Brazil. And uh, in these 17 years that I have been in this position, uh, I have uh, helped more than maybe 2,000 companies entering the Brazilian market. Uh, but um, today I'd like to cover some aspects of doing business uh, in Brazil in, a, in an effective way. So there are lots of talks about Brazil, how Brazil is difficult to enter, high import duties and uh, uh, I want to go over these issues and explain that uh, this is, at first sight, bad, but it's not that bad because companies do business here in Brazil and they profit uh, of the, in, in doing business uh, here. So we are here to assist you. My office is based out of Sao Paulo in the business district. So if you need any, any support, uh, just let me know. I'll go over the slides, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those at the end. So Brazil is a, uh, is a, is a large country. Uh, so we have a population of 208 million people. GDP is approximately $1.8 trillion. GDP per capita, though, is, is low, $8,651. The GDP is expected to grow in 2018 by 3%. Uh, we are coming out of the deepest recession in the past uh, 100 years. So it, that's a very good sign. Unemployment is still high, but uh, it shall decline this, this year. Inflation is under control, is around 3%. That's the expected inflation for 2018. And uh, last year, we had an inflation of less than 1%, so it's pretty good. Uh, international reserves are approximately $350 billion. That's a good sign because it maintains the stability of the hard currency versus the local currency. So exports and imports are not that, that great, but uh, we are doing fine. So if you want to consider Brazil, Brazil is a self-sufficient country. We have most of the Fortune 500 companies doing business here, and they import and export a lot. So there are plenty of, of uh, opportunities in this market. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so recession is over. This is what I've just mentioned. So, uh, we, uh, despite the fact that we have a president impeached, uh, 
last year, uh, it has been a, a peaceful transition. Uh, we Brazil is a very peaceful country. It has never entered or engaged in in any uh, war recently. I think the last one Brazilians fought was World War II, and that's it. So it's a very, very peaceful country. We live well with our neighbors, despite some challenges in Venezuela. But um, uh, everything is fine. Uh, we know that all the uh, the government officials are are are. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kim. Uh, we know that uh, government officials are confident that this is going to be a great year. And also, the last uh, statement is very, very interesting. The stock market soared. It went up by 20% in just two months. And uh, this gives you the perspective of how working in the developing economy is. You have ups and downs. And when things really go, go up, they really go up. So uh, that's a good sign. Next slide, Kim. So uh, this you can read through. I don't need to go over the details, but that's how the Brazilian culture is. Once you get uh, to Brazil in one hour, you'll be accustomed to these uh, to this uh, cultural aspects of uh, meeting and greeting people. So greetings, uh, uh, we kiss a lot here. We shake hands all the time, and we hug. This is a very touching society. In terms of uh, timing and scheduling, the problem is the bad traffic. Uh, even though uh, we have Google Maps and uh, Waze everywhere and every, everyone is using those, it's hard to predict uh, the time of your arrival, uh, let's say, a few days in advance. You know, uh, up front, if you're going to be a few minutes late or early when you're driving. But... Um, Usually, you have to plan uh, in leaving, uh, let's say, an interval between meetings of approximately one hour because you never know how, how bad the traffic can be. Uh, executives usually arrive at 7 and leave, uh, arrive at 9 a.m. and leave at 7 p.m. So it, it's a long day. And in between, we have business lunches. They, they last like uh, if you are in a business lunch, it can take up to two hours or three hours. But if it's just lunch, it's going to be like 30 minutes or so. So it's, it's uh, very complicated to move around in metropolitan areas. So we schedule up to four meetings a day. But ideally i would go with three meetings per day i think that's a, that's a good number of meetings to have if you want to have a solid conversation and go over details next slide please so body language uh this in some cultures this is not common but uh eye to eye contact is very important so you feel that you're going you're you're being listened by the other per person and then you get to know that the other person is understanding what you're saying. So eye-to-eye -eye contact is very important. It's never challenging. Uh, handshake, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, is very common. Beginning at the end of meetings, uh, we do this all the time. Uh, business cards. This is very interesting. When you, we go to trade shows, we usually bring a stack of business cards, like uh, 50 business cards per show at least uh, that we go because we have to exchange cards with everyone we meet so and that's expected so when you come to brazil please bring a nice stack of cards and uh bring more than you usually bring otherwise you're going to be short of them uh, <clears throat> well it's very uh, common in business meetings that you're served uh, coffee and water every time so everywhere you go people will offer you coffee and water and this is something like it, it's very cultural it's something that uh, it's something to to please the the guest so be prepared uh, you don't need to drink coffee all the time you, you can refuse but that's fine uh, after a few cups uh, you'll be fine uh, coffee is not that strong I mean, for us, uh, it's diluted and it has a lot of sugar. It's very, very sweet. And uh, uh, 
the people stand close together when conversing or standing in lines. Yes, uh, that's very common. If you're taking any public transportation, be prepared because people will come closer and closer because public transportation may get packed in the big cities. And uh, people talk all the time. Uh, uh, we have a very, very friendly atmosphere in Brazil. People talk to each other. So uh, this is, this is a, a, a good side of the Brazilian culture. Next slide, Kim. Uh, <clears throat> corporate and culture. Don't be surprised if your arm or back are, 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 are touched. Uh, so we, we try to speak with our hands like Italians do. And that's part of the European heritage that we have. But then when it comes to language, uh, this could be a problem. English is spoken by just 20% of the executives. And um, so for, uh, so in cases uh, where companies come and don't speak English, so we offer translators to accompany those companies uh, to the meetings. So this could be a good idea and uh, we can provide uh, drivers and interpreters to go with the companies and meet with their prospects. Uh, some people ask me, okay, but I speak Spanish. I took Spanish lessons in school for 10 years. Can I do well in Brazil? Yes and no. Usually uh, people in South America, Spanish people, Spanish speaking people in South America, they fully understand Portuguese because they, they, the sounds are, are similar and somewhat they absorb the culture uh, by coming to Brazil, by, by visiting Brazil, by meeting with Brazilians in their respective countries. But if, if the, the, that person is not comfortable in dealing in Spanish and Portuguese at the same time, this, this could be a challenge because it's very normal when Brazilians notice that the other party speaks Spanish and is not understanding, they try to switch to Portuñol. That's a, that's a, a language that is created, uh, let's say, out of the blue. And people try to, to switch words between Spanish and Portuguese, and that becomes a mess. So it, it's very difficult to, to hold a conversation in Portuñol if you're not familiar uh, with the words. So uh, this is something that definitely we can help and gauge uh, how you can uh, do business and how you can uh, communicate in Brazil. So, and we suggest topics uh, for discussions when you are, let's say, breaking the ice. So soccer is, uh, is, a, is a good topic to talk about family, music, that's fine. But we never go personal. We never ask about how old you are or how much money you're making, if you're married or not married, because this implies that you're being too intrusive to, to the other person. So you can ask those things in the second or third time that you meet with that, that person. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, we exchange business cards in, in the first meeting that we have. And the second topic is very, very annoying to some people because interruptions are really constant. Secretaries, assistants come to the meeting room and sometimes they interrupt. Or when you're talking, somebody will jump in and start talking at the same time. But this is pretty acceptable. This is part, part of the cultural, uh, let's say, environment. Uh, negotiations uh, happen during mealtime because this is the time when, when, when you have already discussed all the topics during your formal meeting, then you go to lunch with that person and then you start talking about topics that were not covered or the doubts that came out after the meeting. And usually at the end, we try to summarize, putting together like a next steps plan. So what are the next plans? What are you going to do? When are you going to send me an email? When are you going to send me a proposal? And uh, what should we do? And uh, this is something uh, usually done at the end of the meals. What to wear? Uh, 
it's important to dress uh, conservatively, conservatively, because if this is the first time that you meet with a person. Uh, some years ago, we had a commissioner who came to Brazil and he thought that uh, we were wearing flower shirts. And that was a disaster because he was meeting with government officials. They, they, were, they were always in dark suits and, and, uh, and ties. And uh, that creates some kind of embarrassment on his end. So when you, you're coming for business meetings, dress conservatively uh, with a suit, uh, preferably or if not with a polo or any long sleeve shirt that that's fine but don't go beyond that so uh, and then at the, at the last paragraph I say that when you're visiting uh, a, a Brazilian home it's usually it's common practice to bring like a, a bottle of wine or flowers or, or something uh, that express your gratitude in being invited uh, to, to their homes. Next slide, please. So relationship. So usually business is done face to face and people to people. And when people leave, usually they, they bring with them the contact information. So even though uh, this is good it, it it plays on your end that you need to keep in contact with that person with that company all the time so if somebody if if the person who who used to be your contact leaves the company then you can ask who his or her predecessor his successor is and then you can talk and and go back to the past and 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 uh and recover the relationship but uh, this is very important that you keep a very good relationship with your 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 client uh, brazil is a large country and uh, the, con the the size of the brazilian territory is equivalent to to the to the, to the continental us uh, so travel traveling from south to north can take up to four four hours and a half so it, it's very far away and uh, the business culture is different from the south to the north the this the southern part of brazil was colonized by europeans so we have lots of germans uh, germans spanish uh, portuguese italian descent uh, in the southern part of Brazil. In the state of Sao Paulo, this is, this is the place where immigrants came from all, of, all over the world. We have the Europeans, we have North Americans, we have Asians, everybody met here. And uh, so we have a, 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 a melting pot of cultures. Uh, Rio is pretty much the same. And then north, north, northern part of Brazil, as we go, you see more and more uh, a relaxed atmosphere. But it doesn't mean that people are, uh, do business in a more relaxing way. In my opinion, it's easier to do business in Sao Paulo and southern part of Brazil than doing business in the northern part of, uh, of Brazil because these people tend to focus on local suppliers, so on regional aspects of doing business. So if you have plans to enter the Brazilian market, focus first in Sao Paulo and the second focus will be in southern part of Brazil. Uh, last slide, the, the, the last paragraph says, Brazilian business is hierarchical. Yes, uh, so you can talk to a nice person, you can have a very nice conversation, but the decision is going to be made by the number one in the company. So you have to, walk your way through and you have to convince everyone in the pyramid that you have a good service or product to offer. Next slide, please. So what are the requisites to enter the Brazilian market? And, and this is something that uh, we can uh, help companies. We can assist because we have been doing this for almost 18 years. So, uh, 
usually we talk to companies and uh, we evaluate the products or services. So based on demand, on, on habits of consumption, customer needs, and then uh, we offer competitor pricing analysis. We evaluate how the, the channel or the distribution channels are going to be. The uh, regulatory environment is a critical issue. It hurts all the time, especially products in the healthcare industry or in the food industry. Entry barrier is always there and we are here to assist you in how to overcome those uh, entry barriers. Uh, the cost, cost of goods sold in Brazil is very sensitive. This is a, very, uh, is a country very sensitive on pricing. But uh, when you compare the manufacturing cost, one is going to be really, really surprised because the manufacturing cost in Brazil is very high because the cost of capital, the working, working capital cost is high. It's way above, it's two times more expensive to, do, to, uh, to go to a bank in Brazil than to go to a US bank. And the uh, credits are not that generous in Brazil. So at the end of the day, what you need to prove to be successful in this market is that your product or service deserve a premium price. Usually what we say is, if your product or service can show that there is a, a, a value of 20 to 30% compared to the local product, then you have a competitive product. Why is that? Because at the end of the day, uh, people perceive that quality is, uh, is embedded in US made products. It is different than locally made products. So there is this conscious of uh, the brand. The made in USA brand is very strong in the minds of Brazilians. And if you can prove that your product lasts, let's say 20 to 30% more, it delivers 20 to 30% more in terms of performance or something else, then you are in the ball game. Uh, import duties are expensive, yes they are, but uh, the 30% uh, benefit offsets the, the high import duties. Because when you compare apples and apples, the same product, a product manufacturer in Brazil and an imported product, the difference is going to be approximately from 20 to 30%. So if you can show that you can deliver that difference, that's fine. And to start doing business here in Brazil, we usually recommend that you start with a sales agent, an independent sales agent, that you don't need to pay like a, a retainer, you just pay a commission uh, and, and that's it. When businesses start growing, then you have a distributor or then you set up a distributor who can be your, your previous sales agent. And uh, also think about uh, a joint venture with an existing local company because this may speed up the process of entering the market or through an, uh, an acquisition. So there are so many alternatives in, in how to do business. That depends on, on, on the size of the deal, on, on the importance of the Brazilian market to that specific company. Next slide, please. So we have opportunities and, and this is just a list of industries. So next slide, uh, Kim. So, uh, sorry, life science. So we have pharmaceutical, 500 plus pharmaceutical companies, local and international companies. This is a market of $22 billion and never, never stops growing. This is a really, really great market if you are in that industry. It's regulated, yes, it's regulated. But when you look at nutritional supplements, this is an ex exceptional growth. So with the well-being factor playing an important uh, fact in everybody's lives, so this has an enormous potential to grow. So this is one sector to, to keep in mind. Next slide, please. 
medical equipment and devices. This is the largest market in South America. Healthcare is uh, universal in Brazil. Uh, so uh, all healthcare is supposed to be provided by the government, but you cannot treat 210 million people with uh, Medicare or healthcare, free healthcare or Medicare service. So in Brazil, we have private hospitals and we have health plans. Uh, it's different from insurance company because we have a, a, a mix, uh, a model that, that derives from the insurance companies. But at the same time, we have healthcare providers like uh, big companies like uh, One Health or United Healthcare uh, based out of the US. They come to Brazil, they buy hospitals, they uh, make agreements with doctors and they provide services to their members. So, and this is a market that is growing like crazy because they can charge more than inflation. So depending on the demand, uh, annual, annual increases may go up to 10% or 15% because they say that the cost of healthcare is growing above inflation. And this is a, a great market. So uh, I work with uh, PNC Bank. I do trade financing deals. And uh, in the past year, I financed 20 robots from, uh, from California. And these 20 robots went to 10 uh, private hospitals in Brazil in one year. So this, for example, this is a market that is booming. Because when you consider Brazil, out of the 210 million people think that 15% of those have the same purchasing power as any developed country. So when you're looking at 210, let's say 15%, 20%, something between 35, 40 million people, they have enough purchasing power to buy anything in the world. So this is a great market. So just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Food industry, this is growing like uh, the nu nutritional supplements, healthy food, organic ingredients. Uh, in Missouri, we know that there are great equipment suppliers for the food industry, and uh, this is growing. Brazil is one of the top three exporters of protein. Brazil is great on, on beef, uh, chicken, uh, pork, and, and fishes. So this is a great market. If any of the attendees work in the food industry, this is, this is awesome. Uh, uh, if if we if the 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 issue of high tariffs is something that is blocking the entry of american uh, goods to brazil i i could say that th this is wrong because we have so much alaskan fishes coming to brazil that um, this is crazy this is going this is going wild what people here are looking for are novelty products. They want innovative products. They want something new to taste, to, uh, to, to try, to have an experience. So there are lots of opportunities. If you're looking at the Me Too product, very likely that won't succeed. But if you're looking for something unique, something more innovative, this is the market for that product. Next slide, please. So we have agricultural equipment. This is uh, an agricultural based economy. So this is huge. Brazil is one of the top two, if not the top exporter of soybeans and corn and grains, over, and grains uh, overall. So this is a huge, huge market with very sophisticated equipment and machinery. All satellite controlled, very precise farming, this is a market that invests a lot of money. Next slide. Uh, Brazil is home of Embraer. Embraer is in negotiations with uh, Boeing as we speak. Very likely the, the civilian side of Embraer is going to be, let's say, merged 
with uh, Boeing in an acquisition type of agreement and the uh, military aircraft will be left with Embraer for strategic reasons. But uh, what I want to tell you and uh, what I said in the very beginning about traffic in large cities is the number of executive jets and helicopters that we have in the metropolitan areas. So Sao Paulo has the second large, largest fleet of helicopters and executive jets. Uh, business people don't want to get stuck in traffic so they take this uh, they take helicopters and fly from one place to another this is a great market for suppliers of uh, aerospace parts next chemicals uh, even though brazil is almost self sufficient these are some of the uh, of the chemicals that brazil imports and most of these imports come from the us so this is a, a great market for large distributors that want to, be, to do business here. Next. In terms of IT, ICT, this is a market that is growing like crazy. Uh, we have a young population and uh, we have more mobile cell phone lines uh, than uh, landlines. And this keeps growing. So the last, I think, census we had approximately uh, 257 million cell phones for 210 people million people so there's uh, more than one cell phone for each individual cloud computing is growing and uh, we see more and more uh, free services of internet available or, or free services of wi-fi available in the majority of the cities buses uh, trains everywhere Next slide. So this is a very, very congested uh, map. Um, Kim and Chad asked me to, do, to draw a map and pinpoint where the key industries are located. And this is really difficult uh, to do because we have a diverse based industry, industrial base. And uh, as you can see by the, the big bubbles, Sao Paulo concentrates most of the business. So if you're looking to visit places in Brazil, you should go after the, 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 largest, the largest circles. Those are the, the sites where you're going to find the most diversified industries. And usually what we have in those uh, sites are a combination of all industries together. So you have from IT to healthcare together with uh, automakers, with suppliers of aerospace parts. They are all concentrated in the large uh, circles. So I can go over details for each of these states and uh, with more detail if we have more time and I'll be happy to, to have calls or, or emails after the webinar is over. Next slide, please. So this is my company, Trade BRZ. Uh, so we have been doing this for the past 18, 17, 18 years. We started in 2001 at the MCHAM, initially hired by one single state, the state of Pennsylvania. And so far we have already served more than 15 American states. Today, uh, my company works for the states of Maryland and Florida and the traffic is huge. We have a delegation coming in, in, in 30 days of uh, 12 companies in the healthcare industry. They're going to display their products at Hospital R. And then in June, we're going to have a delegation of 25 services, services oriented companies, real estate, lawyers, accountants, they're coming to Brazil. And uh, we are going to have 25 companies, approximately 50 to 60 executives coming all together. And uh, we are going to set up one-on-one -on -one appointments and these people are going to meet with prospects. And that's the objective. Uh, just to give you numbers, at Hospital R, every year we do approximately 40 to $45 million in deals. And uh, before companies come, uh, we try to work with them on all these topics, on finding the right product for the market, 
uh, estimating the demand based on the pro on the product. We do the value chain analysis where they can benefit the most in this market, how to overcome uh, uh, barriers in this market, how competition is. And then we try to write in four hands uh, a business plan. And then we, we, based on what was discussed in that business plan, we are able to locate partners and distributors, agents whatsoever. And then follow up, follow up. This is a key for this business. If you want to succeed, and then I go back to what I said in the very beginning, you have to, to cultivate your, your client. You have to be close to the people that you're doing business because this is relationship driven uh, business model. You have to work with people, not with companies. Next slide, please. So basically, that's what we do. Uh, we uh, introduce the right people uh, to companies in the US. We do calls together. We, do, we participate in meetings. We can check performance using uh, Dun & Bradstreet, for instance, or any company similar to that. And we do our recommendations. We are not shy to say, OK, your product doesn't fit in this market. Sorry about that. But I think that's a, that's a good sign of professionalism, because at the end of the day, you're not going to be wasting time and resources in, in a country that your product is not welcome. But most of the time, we always find niches where you can be competitive, because we always try, try to, to persevere and find something that uh, is in demand by the Brazilians or by the Brazilian business people. Next slide. And now I turn over to uh, to Chad. Chad? Can you can you hear me now? Oh, sorry about that. Yes, my mic was muted there. Um, yes, we can hear. You. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Fabio, for your great uh, presentation and education on on what it means to do business in Brazil and what we can do to uh, uh, build relationships down there. So, um, yeah, now Darcy and I are going to kind of go over some of the uh, pitfalls or, or, or potential pitfalls that a lot that may, maybe many, many of you have faced while trying to send product to Brazil or, or, or anticipating that those pitfalls um, to come if you're, if you're getting ready to do this. Um, we talked about the culture. Let's now talk about, you know, how we can create a seamless shipping process. So. Um, I do want to remind everyone that Brazil is tough to ship to, and uh, there's many reasons for that, but don't be dissuaded. Um, we have many experts, not only here at Scarborough, but um, among our uh, uh, numerous agents that we, that we deal with across the globe, we have some very, very strong relationships with those agencies in Brazil to navigate those issues. And as you know, items change, whether it be duty rates or requirements in regard to documentation or or registration, we can, us and our partners in Brazil can help assist you in, in that process so you're not alone and not uh, facing fines or fees. Um, Darcy's here to, to help us uh, along that process as well. Darcy is a very uh, seasoned veteran in, in regards to Brazil and uh, she'll, she'll help us with that. Uh, the, one of the first things to, as the slide points out, one of the first things to, to keep in mind, um, both for importers and exporters, that you guys would have to register with the Foreign Trade Secretariat down in Brazil. Um, this is a lot like, um, the, the process ends up uh, resembling a lot like us in America getting an EIN number or a federal identification number uh, for tax purposes. Down there, it's a lot of the same, same reasonings and same, same procedures. You end up at the end getting what's called a CNPJ number um, for, for, your, for your registration. Um, also, all Brazilian importers must have a Brazilian broker. So that means that all the U.S. shippers or foreign shippers uh, are not able to do what's called DDP, Inco terms. And some of you may be familiar with that. If not, we'll kind of touch on that in a little bit here. But uh, it's not we're not able to uh, prepay or or have a U.S. shipper be a importer of record in Brazil because uh, a Brazilian 
not only must they, must they be registered, but they also must have a Brazilian broker in Brazil. So we can work and help you guys. If, if you or your importer does, does not have a Brazilian broker they work with, um, our agents down there um, are great resources for that. And, and they can provide that service for you or can help, help you find other Brazilian brokers that would work with your products or your industry. Um, next slide. Um, next, we're going to talk, kind of talk about some of the documentation, and Darcy is uh, well versed in this, and so I'm going to let her kind of start off the the uh, the requirements. Thanks, Chad. Um, as with almost every shipment that you send out of the country, we have to have a commercial invoice, a packing list. Um, sometimes we have to have additional documentation, or your clients may request additional documentation. For Brazil, we have to have originals. It's just a customs requirement. They aren't trying to be difficult. They just want originals. Um, as Chad mentioned, DDP is absolutely not allowed in Brazil, and it is because of tax reasons. So if you agree to do a delivery or a door delivery with your client, the most you can do is a DAP. Um, that's as far as you're going to get to go. Um, as Kim is showing you the slide, you can see the most preferable is what she's highlighted in red with CIF. Um, that benefits both the seller and the buyer. Each side gets to control a little bit of the transportation process. Again, DDP is not going to happen. So if you have a client that is insisting on DDP, you need to back up just a little bit and ask them, you know, who is advising them that that can be done or why they are so insistent on doing it because Brazilian law prohibits it. Um, there are information that needs to be on the commercial invoice and the documents have to be consistent all the way through. So you have to have the shipper and the consignee be the same on both packing list, commercial invoice. Your INCO terms have to be clearly stated on your commercial invoice. We always also recommend that you take out cargo insurance, and it's for your own best interest as well as your customer's best interest. Nobody knows what's going to happen, and that is some additional uh, benefits, just as you would have car insurance, you have health insurance, this is no different. You need cargo insurance. Um, a client that doesn't want cargo insurance, that's fine, um, but you can still take it out if you so wish. Um, a client may ask you for what we call a certificate of origin. We can issue those on your behalf without any additional fuss or difficulties. Um, bills of lading are important because that's the transport document that moves it from your facility down to the customer's facility. Uh, Kim, can we go to the low lading slide, please? There we go. Um, there are some additional requirements on the bill of lading, and the NCM number may seem a little unfamiliar or kind of questioning, why do I need this? The NCM number counters or matches our harmonized tariff number or schedule B number. And maybe what is or isn't known is that the first six digits of the harmonized tariff are universal throughout the world. So it doesn't matter where you're shipping in the world, those first six digits are going to be the same. The last four in the U.S. are for statistical purposes. As far as Brazil is concerned, they only want the first four digits. That should be the same in their country as it is in our country. They may ask you to show a four digit that's within the same chapter, but the last two digits may be slightly different. That is acceptable. It's based on how they're going to classify it once it comes into their country. This is not an option. This is not if you feel like it. It has to be on that bill of lading or else you're going to have problems getting it cleared through Brazilian customs. So, and next slide, Kim. Thank you. The bills of lading, both the master and the house bill, have to be original and they will have to be rated. It is a Brazilian requirement. The original master bill of lading 
can be issued at destination, and that is a very common practice. Um, the bills of lading, like the commercial invoice and other documents, are signed in blue ink. And the reason it's blue ink is so that they can tell it is actually an original. If it's in black ink, it's too easy to consider it a forgery. Um, one of the last um, additional pieces of information that needs to go on the bill of lading is the ISPM 15 requirement. Some of you may or may not be familiar with that. That is in reference to wood packing material. Brazil signed on to that program just like the U.S. did um, several years ago. Brazil signed on just a couple of years ago. That relates to wood coming in is considered to be pest free. And we all know that there are some unwanted bugs sometimes that end up in wood that if it isn't treated properly can do damage to the ecological environment for the destination countries. Um, that simply is just whether or not you have wood packing, if it's been treated and certified, if it's processed or it's not treated and not certified. It, we can figure that out or we ask those questions and those that information can be passed to us either through a shipper's letter of instruction or through an actual uh, certificate from the the company that provided the wood packing material. Uh, and if your customer has any other documentation requirements, just let us know and we can, you know, see if we can assist with it or, you know, find out, you know, specifically what they're looking for. Uh, additional documents sometimes are certificates of origin or they actually want uh, a certificate of insurance. Next slide, Kim. Again, we talked about that the bills of lading have to be rated. We cannot show as agreed. It's just not going to be accepted. If anyone is concerned that, well, I don't want my client seeing, you know, the rated bill, we are very, very careful with our partners, and that information is very confidential. It's only what is only needed to be passed along is passed along. So um, we try to make sure that everything matches from a freight standpoint to what's on the commercial invoice. Next slide, Kim. We talk about details that things must match across all documents, constant e name, CNPJ number. We also talk about that piece counts, description, port of loading, all of these things have to match. And we go through a, a strenuous check and balance process within the organization of Scarborough. If I have a shipment, I check it, then I have one of my colleagues check it. We then send the documents down to our Brazilian agent. They review it, and then they send the documents on to the consignee for them to review. It is always a good practice that before any exporter sends us their Brazilian documents, that they have already had the documents vetted by their customer in Brazil so that by the time it gets to us, they should already know that the documents should be fine. We strenuously push that all of this be done well before the vessel sails, but no later than 24 hours before the vessel sails. If we do not have that done for some reason, you can imagine it is a very, very important reason why it's not been done. So, um, but again, we push very hard for everything to be done prior to sailing. Any discrepancies are resolved and handled and managed before we get to sailing. Once we have all the original documents, then we send them down and everything is there well in advance of the vessel arriving, which is very important for Brazil and a very helpful aspect for them to get it cleared timely. Kim, next slide. Again, documents have to be presented timely. If they are not, there can be serious fines and penalties assessed. And from my years of experience, I have seen Brazil impose some very stiff fines for inaccuracy in documents. Um, I think one of the last times I heard somebody incurred at least a $35,000 fine. And these are things that you cannot and do not want to incur in doing business in Brazil. It's, it's very important that you have 
a forwarder that understands the Brazilian market. You have a forwarder that has good contacts in Brazil with other forwarders that can provide good efficiencies and take care of potentially avoiding any discrepancies in your documents. Next slide, Kim. These are our major ocean ports in Brazil. The two primaries are Santos and Rio de Janeiro. The smaller ports, um, Fortaleza and Manaus, they're up in northern Brazil. We have Paranagua, Vitoria, and some of the other ones. They are smaller, um, but you can still reach them with most of the major carriers. Next one, Kim. The main airports are Garulas and Veracopas. We also can do Rio and Porto Alegre. You'll notice that Sao Paulo has two airports, passenger and cargo. Literally, Brazil prefers all of their cargo to run through Veracopas. It's much more efficient and more streamlined, and it keeps cargo away from passenger flights as well. Also, if we have freighter aircraft, it has to go into Veracopas. So as some of you may or may not know, freighter aircraft do not run every day and they don't fly everywhere. So it's if that is something that's needed, we need a little extra time to make sure we can meet your needs and, and, and get you the service that you want. Next slide, Kim. Chad, yes. back to Great. you. Thank you for all the information. Um, that was very helpful. And you know, we, we have a few questions. I want to be I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so um, we will go right until two thirty, um, and we will stick around and try to answer some questions for those that are able to stick around with us. If you have to leave, um, we will be able to put these um, onto our YouTube channel later, so you can go back and listen to the questions that you missed if you have to uh, depart at two thirty. Um, we have a bunch of great questions from everyone, both before the presentation started and even during. Um, I know uh, um, Fabio, Fabio has answered uh, some of the questions for us, and I'll, I'll get to those um, by text here. Also, um, we're going to run through some of the questions quick here. Uh, Fabio, can you give us kind of a little bit of a, a breakdown of the Brazilian tax structure for um, as people are importing goods, what that looks like, or are taxes high? Are they low? Give us a little bit of a snapshot of that if you can. Well, this is a little bit complicated. I don't want to bore, to bore everyone with uh, this these details. So rule of thumb, if you consider like the average import duties is approximately 13%, that's the average. At the end of the day, your product is going to reach the, is going to leave customs costing approximately 80% above uh, the FOB price. Uh, this could be considered very, very high, but if you consider how local taxes are calculated, uh, the same product manufactured in Brazil is going to, let's say, leave the, the plant in Brazil for 100, uh, let's say, coins, and it's going to be sold for 150. So when you compare an imported good, it will leave the U.S. for 100, and then it will reach the final buyer for 180. So that's the 30% that I was talking about. So uh, our taxes are uh, on top of each other. So you calculate. So you have the the cost of shipping to Brazil, then you add the import duties, and then you start adding local taxes, and that multiplies and reaches 80%. So in a nutshell, that's how it works. But if you want to have the breakdown of each cost, then you have to go to a freight forwarder like Scarborough and then ask for details and uh, how. And the most important thing is, is not to make a mistake in how to uh, put the right uh, harmonized code to your product. And they are specialists in doing that because they have a local person here in Brazil. And uh, I, I always recommend to exporters that use companies that have a local agent operating in ports or airports in Brazil, because at the end of the day, that person is going to be responsible in clearing the goods. If they make a mistake, that's going to be on his or her shoulder to clear the product in, uh, in an efficient way. So 
if uh, this is really uh, not an easy game. So you have to rely on the right people for the right job. So that's why we always recommend to use experienced freight forwarders and companies that can clear the customs in an, in an efficient way without any hassle or any surprise to you or, or, or your clients. Uh, I see that many people uh, are looking at penalties and uh, well, are, are, are thinking about the penalties that may be charged. And this is really uh, something very problematic that if you don't deal with companies like Scarborough, you may end up in trouble. All right. Thank, thank you, Fabio. Yeah, that's great. Um, Darcy, um, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. In regard to the, the certificate of insurance that you spoke about earlier, are telling everyone that mm -hmm. they should get insurance for their goods. Um, is it is it is the certificate of insurance specific to the order or, or a particular shipment? Or is it just an addition to the insurance that we carry with the carrier, so to speak? Is it it's it's shipment specific and it's in addition to what you there's per se not insurance with the carrier you have legal liability which is different um if you don't have cargo insurance the carrier will only pay you so much for your cargo and that's it that's your only recourse you could have half a million dollars in product and lose half a million and if you don't have cargo insurance the carrier will say, well, legal liability is all I'm, uh, that's all I owe you. And you'll get a fraction of what the cargo is actually worth. So cargo insurance is always strongly recommended. It is additional cost for the shipment, but it's, it's a inexpensive amount considering what you're doing and where you're going and what it covers you for. Okay, great. Does that does that help? I think it does. Um, yeah, we had a couple couple folks ask that similar question, so I think that'll hopefully help them out. Um, okay. Hey, Fabio, I got one for you too now. Um, has customs become a friendlier structure for imports um, to Brazil? Um, have they? Can you tell us more, kind of even about um, some of the the Brazilian strikes that have happened as well in the, in that process? Well, this has been going on and off for several months. And um, this, in fact, doesn't affect the operations at ports and airports. They have been on strike. Uh, they want to have a, a pay increase in their salaries, and they keep going to the media saying, okay, we're on strike. But uh, they're always on strike, unfortunately. So, but it doesn't affect the operations. There, there could be like control delays here and there, but business is done as usual. So you, you may face a few days of delays here and there but it's just a matter of having the right agent going to the custom official and explaining the situation okay we have this cargo it's urgent it needs to to leave uh, Sao Paulo and go to Rio and it has to be there in 24 hours can you do something and uh, they, they, they can accommodate these uh, these requests without any other major issue so we know this is a problem. It goes to the media, but at the end of the day, everything is working uh, well. Not perfectly, but well. Okay. Uh, I got one more for you, Fabio. Um, I, some, someone asked, I'd like to know more about how uh, the supply chain security issues when shipping from U.S. from when shipping the U, shipping from the U.S. my product to Brazil um, is piracy or stolen goods an issue? Is that a, is that something that you that worry about in Brazil? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, both both sides, uh, exports from Brazil to the U.S. Uh, they have to be scanned, and and the same way. So there are restrictions. We have a very tight uh, surveillance, healthcare and agricultural surveillance on products. So this is this is really a big issue. And now that you raise this uh, this subject, it's very important. Recently, uh, last year, we had an embargo by European buyers of Brazilian beef or Brazilian beef and, and, and chicken, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, it took a while until they cleared all the aspects. And now another problem has been raised by the, the Brazilian Federal Police 
and very likely this will create an impact on exports of protein from Brazil to other countries. So that's something that uh, one in this industry should be aware of and uh, take a careful look because the, the largest exporters of protein are somewhat involved. They're going through, a, a, let's say, a, a, a fight about the control of the company and this is a multi-billion dollar company, and apparently uh, they are leaking some bad information, and uh, that was uh, found, the, the information, the bad information was found to be true by the federal police. So this is uh, really critical. So for importers of protein from Brazil, they should be watching this very closely. Okay, great. Um, that's even as you talked that's even it was even more resonating in my mind another reason to uh to pick up uh insurance for my cargo that way <laughs> i can protect it against a lot of those things um I, another question we have is uh, are exports from brazil to the u.s um as complex or detailed as as it is from the u.s to brazil would you say that fabio or was that would i think darcy can answer that better. okay that's great Darcy, you want to take it to that? Um, so an export from Brazil into the U.S.? Yeah, they're, they're basically asking, um, is it as detailed? In, in our, from our point of view, I mean, it would be a no and to that because it's not as the, – the regulations that we face on the export side from the U.S. to Brazil, um, we see as a lot higher than the – than the, than the uh, restrictions or, or guidelines that the U.S. puts on any goods that are importing into the U.S. That yeah, I would think that if, you know, the question, I would think one of our, our imports, uh, exports, or import experts would be, you know, better qualified to ask, you know, fully explain that uh, question or the, respond to that question, and we can have one of them, you know, contact the individual that asked the question just to you know further clarify if yes. there was something specific about what they were exporting out of Brazil into the US um, I think one of our import team members might be able to ask it, answer that a little bit more thoroughly sure and one thing to keep in mind for all those people who are importing uh, to the US from Brazil uh, currently there are no embargoes with Brazil that means that there won't be any uh, restrictions when you're bringing that stuff any more so than there would be um, into into Brazil you will have actually uh, the same amount of freedoms uh, to import into the US out of Brazil so but yes we can we can definitely have our import team address that as well after the after the webinar we can send an email to those people that ask that um, Darcy I know you, you touched a lot on uh, documentary and stuff do you know of any um, import licenses that are required to go into Brazil um, when you're exporting out of the US? Are there any import licenses that are required? Um, and if so, if, you're con if the cargo does not fit into um, a particular container size, do you have to get multiple licenses per container or is that one license good for all uh, the, the entire shipment size? The Brazilian buyer most likely is going to have an import license. The seller, the exporter out of the U.S. is not likely to have a license requirement, but most licenses are for a specific quantity of product, not a specific number of containers. And they're usually valid for a period of time. Uh, so you could have multiple shipments be covered under one import license. It's a matter of how long it takes you to get that quantity met on the import license, you'll still have the documentary requirements that have to be met as far as commercial invoice, packing list, if there's any need for a certificate of origin, if there's a need for the insurance certificate, those will all have to be issued accordingly and then sent to the the Brazilian broker on behalf of the consignee. So yeah, the import license, requirements it shouldn't be based on number of containers it's specific to the amount of product okay great That's so if it 
So if it takes one container, great. If it takes 100 containers, let us know, because we'll probably want to be in on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so we have, a, we have a ton of questions, and we're kind of running out of time here, so I apologize. We, we'll be able to get to a lot of these other questions by emailing, you, emailing out directly to the, to the, uh, to the question askers. Um, and just a reminder to all those people that are listening and watching, um, we will have this on our YouTube channel later on, so you'll be able to rewatch this or uh, write down any notes that you may have missed as we were going over this. Um, Darcy, you got the last question here. Um, are there any documents that need to be sent to the consulate to be uh, legalized or consularized? No, not with Brazil. Um, as a general rule, shipments that are not covered by a letter of credit do not, requ try, do not require any type of legalization or consularization. Um, and generally, even shipments covered under a letter of credit don't require that either. So it's, if it happens, it's an extreme situation, and it's rare. Okay. But as, as a general rule, no, it does not. Well, that's good to know. Um, sometimes that process can, can be quite costly and uh, labor-intensive to do, so it's a one less hoop to jump through for Brazil. So. Yep. Um, well, great. I just want to thank everyone for uh, attending and letting us uh, um, hopefully provide information to all of you that uh, maybe you didn't know before or maybe it was just reinforced if you did know it before. So uh, um, if you have any other questions that, uh, like I said, that we didn't get answered or if we don't get back to you by email, definitely shoot us another email um, or call us and we will get those answers for you. We always want to be um, a wealth of knowledge for you, even after the fact, so uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Um, but like we said, any, any unanswered questions that we're able to uh, get to, we will shoot those answers out by, by email afterwards. Um, thank you so much, and you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.